Hello, afternoon. I um, hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm Ben Sheldon, um, Director of the Edward Gray Institute, and it is a great pleasure to um, welcome you to um, back to sort of, I guess, you know, a more normal kind of um, seminar than we've been having over the last um, 18 months or so. And it's a particular pleasure today to be um, welcoming um, Professor Scott Edwards from uh, Harvard. He's on sabbatical in Sweden, which is one of the reasons we we're able to persuade him over here. Um, this is a joint, uh, special sort of joint EGI uh, Jenkinson seminar. Um, Scott is, you know, really well known for his work on on integrating, you know, increasingly now large scale genomic studies to understand the evolution of diversity in birds, um, and he's been building that research trajectory over a career that started with being a, um, doing his BA at Harvard, then his PhD at UC Berkeley, postdoc in Florida, first faculty position at Washington, and then back to Harvard about 20 years ago. And um, at Harvard, he is the Alexander Agassi Professor of Zoology and the Curator of Ornithology in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. So, and Scott's gonna be telling us today about the Philo G2P approach to bird biology and evolution. So, Scott, please. Thanks very much, Ben. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. I really appreciate uh, you coming out today. I know it's still challenging, and we're all sort of doing our best to bring back that pre- COVID world, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't have made the trip even from Sweden if it, for a lesser scientist. So Ben, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, and I've had a really wonderful day uh, poking around the museum collections with, uh, with Mark and talking to the great students and, and faculty here. It's really uh, reminded me what an amazing university Oxford is. So yeah, I'd love to tell you a little bit about just a couple different projects we're doing in the lab, and in case you're wondering, I, I'm, I'm the guy that was tweeting last summer uh, as I cycled across uh, the United States. This was sort of a, it wasn't a last minute attempt at uh, diversion, but it was something I'd been thinking about for a couple of years, and for a variety of reasons, it seemed like last summer was a good time to do it. Um, I won't tell you about all the details, except to say that it was a really great way to learn a bit more about my own country. Um, you know, on a bicycle, you are forced to interact with folks. Um, and uh, well, the bottom line is, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of hope out there, I would say, despite all the, uh, the chaos and crises and uh, consternation you read about in the newspapers, there's a lot of generosity and a lot of hope, I would say, for, uh, yeah, moving forward in these challenging times. I also wanted to, in case you haven't heard, we're actually holding a really exciting symposium later this month, just in about two weeks, on pan genomes. Uh, and, you know, if you wanna make the trip to Sweden, hey, I came to the UK, you can come to Sweden, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, think about registering. Um, this is in collaboration with a uh, computational scientist at Chalmers University, Alexander Schlepp. And um, in case you're wondering, pangenomes are, it's one of these terms which the bacterial scientists have been using for uh, a decade or more, but it's still pretty uncommon in folks to think about eukaryotic uh, biology. But basically, it's, it's, it's thinking, it's, the, the goal is to capture all the genetic variation within a species. And you may say, well, we've been doing that as we use these various genomic techniques. But a lot of the approaches we use such as the use of a reference genome can, can bias our capture of genetic variation. Anyway, so a pan-genome approach is one that's trying to uh, not have the biases of a reference genome and to sort of, uh, yeah, allow, capture all the variation in terms of uh, single nucleotide changes, structural changes. Anyway, come to virtually or in person to uh, Gothenburg on the 17th. Uh, we'd love to, uh, to, to, to see you there. Well, I just thought I'd introduce you to my lab briefly. We're um, uh, a wonderful group of postdocs and grad students, and over the years, we've dabbled in various different aspects of bird biology. Uh, I, I really come to biology uh, 
as an ornithologist. Uh, I was a bird watcher since 10 years old, and for better or worse, I tend to formulate my questions uh, on the condition that they be about birds, pretty much. Uh, now, because we're uh, in a museum today, it's very exciting to be here in the Oxford Natural History Museum, and because I, I work in a museum, I thought I'd spend a few minutes just talking about some of the things we've been thinking about in terms of museum science and how museums can serve uh, evolutionary biology in society. And so the Museum of Comparative Zoology, it's a, it's a <coughs> actually it's, it's pretty much exactly the same age as, as this museum. It was founded in 1859. Uh, Louis Agassiz came over from Switzerland. And um, the bird collection used to be up on the fifth floor of this building. It's now moved to the basement of this adjacent building. But we're fortunate nonetheless to have some really nice facilities. And we've thought a lot in the last few years about um, you know, how museums can best serve science and uh, education uh, and society. And we've written a couple reviews that are pretty much coming online just now. The first on museum genomics, and this sort of thinks about uh, some of the practices that museums are using to archive uh, specimens in the service of genomics. Uh, and this one, which is really kind of reviewing some of the really interesting biology that's emerged from the studies, genomic studies on birds um, with, whole, with whole genome sequencing and whatnot. Now, I thought I'd just follow down this track just a little bit um, and <clears throat> to think about museum specimens, not just, a, it's not just about the specimen itself. I, I kind of view specimens as windows into the ecosystem of a particular bird or plant or insect. You know, we can get pollen, for example, from birds like this. We can look at parasites and mites. Uh, we can look at the chemicals uh, on the feathers of these birds. Uh, and so it's nice to think of specimens, not just, it's not just about the, the bird itself, but really as a window into past ecosystems. And so, for example, actually some work that was spearheaded by an undergraduate at Harvard. She was interested in what the effects of heavy metals might be on isolated seabird populations such as this uh, black-footed albatross. And she put together a really nice series of uh, specimens uh, of the species going back to uh, 1880. Many of these specimens actually were not the result of sort of active collecting, but rather were uh, harvested from things like uh, fisheries bycatch. So these are birds that were dead and fortunately were, were put into a museum. And remarkably, she found a really convincing uh, increase over time in organic mercury. One of the challenges with this study was we had to separate the organic mercury <coughs> coming from the environment from the inorganic mercury that was often deposited by curators themselves, either as preservatives or other aspects of the curation process. Anyway, and so this was, I think, a nice example of how specimens can achieve uh, a, a use far beyond their initial uh, reason for being collected. Now, in the US, we actually have continued to actively collect specimens, uh, not only in the United States, but uh, around the world. And I know this, this is, I think, an activity that perhaps has slowed down a bit in, in Europe and the UK. Um, here's an example of just some of the activities of some of the more active uh, museums in the US. Um, and, you know, uh, again, in many cases, I would say a lot of specimens these days are collected with a research program in mind, but there's also a lot of activity to undertake so-called general collecting um, in the hopes that specimens will be of service to people doing unanti uh, asking unanticipated questions. And you can see that, you know, for some of these collections, the, the rate of activity is, is, is pretty substantial. Um, and, um, you know, this is, uh, with every passing year, these specimens are becoming more and more uh, valuable. And over the past 10 years, one of the great joys, I would say, of being the curator of the bird department at Harvard is to train students and to, uh, you know, basically we've been able to travel to various corners of the world. And the reason why we're doing this is because it turns out that a lot of the sp genomic specimens that are in museums today are simply not of high enough quality to 
productively serve the genomics community. Um, we can't retrieve very long strands of DNA from them, and we certainly can't re retrieve RNA and other kinds of macromolecules. And so um, we've, you know, had the good fortune to be able to go to various places, increasing in an increasingly challenging uh, environment of, of permits and whatnot, to try to augment the genomic resources for various birds uh, around uh, the, country, the, the world. And here's an example of some of our, the fruits of some of our labor. And so we probably assembled the largest RNA-ready collection of bird tissues in the world, I suspect. This involved, uh, you know, rapid um, cryopreservation of specimens on site. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, particularly for passerine birds, we have examples of species that uh, from, uh, capture, I think, a lot of the phylogenomic diversity, particularly within passerines. So um, if you're interested, for example, in germline restricted chromosomes, which is this really bizarre bunch of DNA, which is now known to be in the gonads of birds, but is jettisoned during development and is not present in the somatic genome that most of us are sequencing for our projects. Well, we have testis and other tissues here, which you can retrieve that germline restricted chromosome. Or you might be interested in gene expression. These are specimens that, if we fast forward 100 years, we'll be able to look at how gene expression has changed over time. And so, um, you know, this is, I think, some of the kinds of activities that uh, we're hoping will make uh, museum collections more valuable uh, to the uh, research community um, and also just to the general program of education. Um, there's been a lot written, I would say, in the past five, ten years on, um, you know, essentially trying to justify museum collections and ongoing activity. And of course, this is, you know, we know that deans and administrators are always looking at the space that are taken up by these collections and uh, with the eye to putting them towards more productive uses. But there's clearly, I think there's a good argument to be made that, you know, especially in, 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 in pandemics like we're in now, we can learn a lot from museum collections. They're extremely useful in uh, education. Uh, they can have a lot of um, important ways of, of uh, networking communities together that typically don't work together. So um, be good to your local museum and uh, you know, try to uh, support them when you can. Okay, what I'd like to tell you, I'd like to tell you three brief stories about uh, bird uh, evolution, looking at uh, different um, scales um, and different approaches. Um, all of these, I think, have a uh, element of this uh, comparative framework that we've coined uh, Philo G2P, indicating uh, connecting genotype to phenotype via phylogenies. Um, and so uh, I'll tell you first about uh, some work by Maud Baldwin, who's a group leader at a Max Planck in Germany. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some recent work by a PhD student in my group uh, looking at uh, color variation and an interesting leapfrog pattern of biogeography uh, and then I'll spend uh, most of the time talking about some of our ongoing work looking at the uh, convergent evolution of loss of flight in uh, Palignathus birds. And this uh, Philo G2P approach we kind of outlined in a uh, recent article in Tree where we noticed that, uh, you know, phylogenies, of course, are a uh, mainstay of evolutionary biology. And yet most uh, uses of phylogenies, we argued, are directed towards sort of, you know, ecological questions or biogeographic questions or questions of uh, speciation through time. Um, and we didn't see as much work in the area of how do we use phylogenies to connect genotype to phenotype? There's actually been some really interesting work uh, in, in various clades, a lot of interesting work in mammals, for example. Uh, here are some examples um, in, in birds, which uh, I'll talk about this stuff in a bit. Uh, and some recent work uh, by uh, my uh, postdoc, Gustavo Bravo, uh, who's now um, assumed a curatorship at the Humboldt Institute in Colombia, his native country. Um, this was a cool project because looking at these uh, ant birds here, ant birds are a um, uh, large family, over 200 species in South America, and most of them are tied to very uh, 
mesic environments, very humid forest environments. And yet there'd be a few incursions into dry habitats of uh, Brazil, for example, and Peru. And it was very interesting because our, you know, our question was, well, how have these birds adapted to this dry habitat? And what Gustavo found was that uh, the genomic patterns essentially led us to look at their egg structure. Um, we found parts of the genome which were allied to uh, biology of, of eggs uh, using you know, chicken indices and databases. And uh, we were therefore able to actually corroborate some really interesting differences in eggshell thickness in uh, dry habitat ant birds versus uh, wet habitat. So it's a nice example of sort of the genome leading us to uh, the phenotype. Um, and the questions that we'll pose today are, are I think, couched uh, productively in this sort of dichotomy that was raised um, by uh, actually one of the, I, I worked in Alan's lab as a graduate student at Berkeley. Uh, and in 1975, he and Mary Claire King came up with this really uh, interesting paper in which they compared the uh, protein sequences of humans and chimpanzees. This is very early days in um, terms of look, trying to uh, look directly at protein sequences. And so they were using all these really indirect approaches to measure how different humans and chimpanzees were uh, uh, at the protein level. And um, remarkably, you know, they came, they were the ones that came up with the statistic that we still use today, namely that humans and chip differ only in about 1% of their protein sequence or their gene sequence. And uh, that really, that statistic has really stood the test of time. Um, as, as was Alan's, uh, he was able to turn lead into gold with these kinds of results. Some people might say, oh, they, there's no differences, we can't do anything. Alan, of course, turned that on its head and, and said that, well, then these differences must be driven not by gene sequence chains, change, but by regulatory change, by the uh, timing and the placement of expression of genes rather than changes in their gene sequence. So this has been sort of the, uh, the lens through which we've conducted some of our recent studies. And so the first example I'll tell you about involves these uh, taste receptors, which of course are a very direct link between a uh, organism and, and its environment. Uh, this is Maud Baldwin's work, and um, you know, when she proposed to look at uh, taste receptors, I sort of recoiled in horror. It was, seemed like an incredibly complex question. Um, and you know, to be fair, she cast around quite a bit that, you know, during her dissertation and uh, struggled a bit as to how to um, you know, um, measure the, uh, uh, the effect of, of changes in sequence on uh, the, the function of these proteins. Basically, these taste receptors are, they're these heterodimers. It's a very small multi-gene family. Um, and we have umami receptors, which focus on sort of savory or amino acid uh, kinds of compounds versus uh, sweet taste receptors, which focus on uh, carbohydrates and sugars. Um, and we have some great natural experiments out there in which organisms have lost a particular uh, one of these heterodimers, for example, pandas, which, uh, you know, their diet is, is almost, is basically 100% bamboo. So they don't have any need for an umami receptor. And in fact, that receptor has been uh, pseudogenized in their genome. Um, similarly, uh, cats, you know, descending from a, a highly carnivorous lineage have gotten rid of their sweet taste receptor. And so um, we have lots of really interesting natural experiments out there with this uh, very simple multi-gene family. Now, uh, birds are an interesting case study because we know that, uh, you know, there are lots of birds out there that seem to be able to detect sugars. And we know, of course, from experiments that hummingbirds, for example, can um, readily detect the difference between sugar water and plain water. Uh, and yet, uh, no bird that we've found so far actually has the genes to encode the sweet taste receptor. So the question is, how are birds detecting the sweet taste, the, these sweet tastes without the sweet taste receptor? Uh, and Maud sort of um, zeroed in and took a chance that perhaps it's not the sweet taste receptor that's involved, but the umami receptor, the close uh, relative. And so she looked in the first study at uh, hummingbirds, uh, which, of course, can distinguish between sugar water and plain water, and their closest relative, the swifts, 
uh, and chickens, both of which uh, can't uh, tell the difference between uh, uh, sugar water and, uh, and plain water. And she was able to uh, collaborate with a laboratory in Japan, which allowed her to express these uh, native bird receptors on the surface of mammalian cells and actually interrogate what kinds of compounds they could bind to through a simple uh, fluorescence readout. And so uh, she was able to show that the umami receptor of hummingbirds uh, had undergone a series of amino acid sequence changes, which essentially allowed it to bind sugars, okay? And so this was a clear case of gene sequence change leading to a major new adaptive zone. And, and we, you know, we suspect it's in large part responsible for the diversification of hummingbirds into over 300 species. Um, so here's a very direct link between gene sequence change and uh, phenotypic change. Um, in continuing this work, just a few, just this summer, um, some really, uh, another sort of follow-up study in which she looked not at hummingbirds, but at the big radiation of passerine birds, and in particular the songbirds, which we call the uh, sort of the Aussie uh, passerine birds. And first they just did a, little, uh, a literature survey in which they asked about the incidence of uh, nectar and other sweet uh, uh, compounds in um, avian diets. And surprisingly, there was a demonstrable uptick in uh, uh, sweet uh, consumption in the, the Aussie passerine birds or songbirds. And so this led to the question of whether the evolution of sweet taste in hummingbirds was uh, homologous to, or whether it was independent of, the evolution of sweet taste in uh, the songbird radiation. And so the first thing Ma did was to sort of mix and match the uh, components of the heterodimer from uh, hummingbirds and honey eaters, on the other hand. Of course, honey eaters are part of a big radiation of nectarivorous birds in Australia. And remarkably, she found that while the native hummingbird or honey eater uh, receptors could bind sugar, mixing the two subunits did not bind sugar. And so the conclusion here is that, or the suggestion is that the two, uh, the subunits of these heterodimers essentially uh, have not co-evolved between honey eaters and uh, hummingbirds, but instead may have arisen independently. And she was able to corroborate this by showing that coupling the one of the honey eater subunits with subunits from other passerine birds, whether they're sub here or ossines here, clearly showed that coupling with the sub did not elicit any uh, indication of uh, detection of sweet taste, but coupling with um, some very basal ossines including the brown tree creeper, an Australian species. We see a little bit of activity there, but more robustly in these other songbirds showed that the origin of the ability to perceive sweet likely arose very early in the songbird radiation. Um, lyre birds don't seem to have the, the ability to do that, but uh, tree creepers, which are a very early branch of the songbird radiation, uh, appear to have the ability to uh, detect sugar. So this was a nice sort of temporal, um, pinpointing a temporal acquisition of an independent ability to uh, detect uh, sweet taste. And also, again, another close connection between gene sequence change and uh, a novel phenotype. We'll switch scales now and think more about the population level. Um, this is just a small study done as one of the chapters of uh, my student, Jonathan Schmidt, who came to my lab with a really amazing um, love for and skill at field work. I think, uh, you know, field work is, um, it's challenging with the flood of genomic data that we have, but it was very heartening to uh, talking to some of Ben's students today that, you know, field work is, I think, that's, a, that's certainly where all our questions come from and just sort of watching birds in nature and, and seeing what they're doing. And so uh, Jonathan decided to follow up on a really interesting uh, pattern discovered by uh, a well-known ornithologist at Louisiana State University, um, uh, James Van, Van Rempson, who published a paper in 1984 
pointing out this leapfrog pattern of coloration in the Andes. And so this is a pattern in which uh, widespread species up, or up and down the Andes have populations that are similarly plumaged in the north and the south, but which are intervened by a contrasting population in the center. Uh, and it turns out that in different lineages, the breaks between these colors occur in different places. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very intriguing pattern, which per perhaps was um, lacking a uh, historical context or an understanding of the context in which it evolved. So this was something that modern genomics could certainly shed light on and might also reveal s aspects of the genomic basis of the color changes. And so, um, uh, John, this is bypassing a huge amount of field work uh, by Jonathan. I was lucky enough to tag along in 2017, and I can assure you that uh, traveling some of these uh, windy roads in the Peruvian Andes, is, uh, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, some of these uh, uh, passes that uh, you're traveling around, especially when a big truck is coming the other direction, it's, uh, I, I basically just closed my eyes and prayed. Um, but uh, he was able to pull off two, two field seasons. And so fast forward to the genomic data. We looked at uh, a little over 100 individuals in this study. And um, remarkably, you know, if you look at the principal component uh, plot of all the SNP variation, um, you see a, a pattern which is remarkably reminiscent of the geographic pattern in the Andes themselves. You, everything down to the, the curvature of this, this plot. And what this means is that these, this is sort of the first indication that these birds probably are undoing a very, a fairly simple uh, isolation by distance sort of uh, variation across the landscape. If, uh, if there was a very complex demography underlying uh, their diversification, we might expect departures of the principal component plot from the uh, plot uh, that you see uh, on the actual map. And this, of course, is a pattern that is seen in other species such as, as humans. You might recall the famous principal component plot of European populations, where, which matches sort of uncannily the actual map on the, uh, on the, uh, the geographic map. And so a main question that we wanted to ask was, you know, did this gray population uh, arise as a novelty or was it really the yellow populations that had undergone some sort of uh, novelty or perhaps convergent evolution? Uh, and this phylogeny shows that um, the gray population falls inside the yellow populations, and so this suggests that it's likely derived from an ancestral yellow condition. Uh, and we also saw some substantial uh, signatures of gene flow between these lineages. So uh, the basic structure is tree-like with the gray population derived, but there's likely some gene flow as well. Now, one of the things about um, you know, exploring new territory is that you discover uh, new things such as hybrid zones. And one of the things Jonathan discovered was this hybrid zone in the southern part of the range. And um, he spent, uh, you know, many weeks sort of trying to do transects across this zone. Um, and I think uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was time well, well spent. Basically, uh, he was able to come back and uh, measure uh, coloration across these birds. Uh, several different patches around the, uh, the crown and the breast. Uh, and basically to... Um, look at the patterns of genomic clines of SNPs across the hybrid zone and see if there's any correlation between the two. Uh, and so here you see um, some examples of the sort of genomic clines in these, uh, the black here, we have sort of uh, SNPs uh, across the genome and their uh, trajectory across this transect. Um, here we have mitochondrial DNA in, mitochondrial DNA in green um, and the plumage patterns in blue, okay? And what's intriguing is that the uh, position and also the steepness of the clines uh, in the mitochondrial DNA in the plumage tend to depart from sort of the genome-wide average. And this is perhaps one suggestion that uh, the clines for these two molecules are, uh, are uh, molded uh, in part by natural selection. Um, just to, this is actually how, these are some of the color patches that Jonathan was looking at. And again, I think is a nice, um, use of museum specimens. It would be hard to measure color accurately in a sort of a, a field environment. Anyway, so using a subset of these individuals, basically we're asking here, uh, 
kind of uh, taking advantage of the hybrid zone to look at um, ad, sort of admixture mapping. And so we're trying to correlate here the SNPs across the hybrid zone with the color variation. And, um, you know, excitedly, we did find some evidence of, of a peak here uh, on one of the contigs. Uh, trust me, I've generated a lot of Manhattan plots which don't deserve the name Manhattan plot because there's no peak. It's more of a suburban plot or something like that. But um, we were excited to see this one peak here. And intriguingly, this peak falls very near a gene called PTS, which uh, turns out to be also implicated in uh, coloration in these wall lizards. This is a system that um, Leif Anderson uh, in Uppsala University has studied. Um, and so it's a potential uh, 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 similar kind of genomic basis for this uh, color pattern uh, in this case. Okay, well, uh, let's move on just to the last story, uh, which involves a system that we've been spending quite a bit of time working on uh, over the past several years. And this is the loss of flight in birds. Now, uh, birds, despite being the paragon of, of, of flight among the vertebrates, have actually lost flight many, many different times. Um, we have instances of loss of flight among the passerine birds, the famous uh, uh, Chatham Island wren. Uh, we have, of course, the dodo, which I saw some amazing specimens of this morning in the collections. We have lots of instances of flightless grebes. We have lots of flightless rails all over the Pacific Islands. Um, and of course, penguins too are, are flightless, although they actually have, of course, retained the keel because they actually fly underwater um, but it's, you know, the Palignathus birds, I think, take the prize in terms of just the repeated loss of flight, or at least what we think now is repeated loss of flight. Um, that's a story in itself in how we came from thinking about a, a single loss of flight in this group to multiple losses. And so we basically, uh, this is work started a long time ago, um, but uh, we, we, we sort of thought it'd be interesting to look at see if we could use the sort of phylogy 2 p approach to understand the genomic basis of loss of flight in these birds. And so the palignates, of course, consist of a lot of well-known groups such as ostriches from Africa, the rheas from South America, emus and cassowaries from <coughs> Australia, and the kiwis from New Zealand. And then there is this uh, diminutive clade of uh, tinamous, which are a uh, about 50 species in the neotropics, which are the only palignates which can fly. They're clearly allied to the ratites uh, in their uh, jaw structure and other aspects of their morphology, but they can actually undergo, you know, sustained flight. It's, it's sort of a burst flight, very much like a grouse, but it's, uh, it's, they're, they're capable of getting off the ground. <clears throat> now, um, some of the key morphological uh, traits which change uh, when flight is lost involve the keel, for example. And so the reason why ratites have that name is because uh, their, key, their, their sternum is very much like a raft. It's lost that keel, which essentially uh, is what uh, volant species use to uh, attach their flight muscles and, and gain some uh, power uh, on lift. A lot of uh, palignates have undergone pretty substantial changes in body size. And of course, um, there's been variable loss or shortening of the forelimb. And so, for example, uh, moas, which are an extinct group of palignates, uh, actually have lost the entirety of all of their digits, humerus and radius, and their ulna. So they have no traces of any sort of forelimb at all. Whereas things like ostrich, of course, you've probably seen the, the you know, they can display with their wings, so they actually do have forelimb elements. Uh, although not substantial enough to, to fly. So this, um, you know, these are all phenotypes associated with loss of flight and I think illustrate the challenge of looking at phenotypes like this because, you know, at some level genomic data can't tell us which components of this sort of multifactorial phenotype might be uh, being driven by any given gene or regulatory region. But hopefully I'll convince you that we can use some really interesting uh, epigenetic approaches such as a tax seek to actually narrow down where uh, in the phenotype a particular genomic region might be acting. <clears throat> now, as I alluded to earlier, the, uh, the old scenario used to be that flight was lost a single time uh, 
in the common ancestor of the uh, uh, Palignes, and that uh, Tinamus were sort of uh, an outgroup. And in fact, in many studies, going back to the 70s and 80s, Tinamus are essentially assumed to be the outgroup. And of course, that results in a fairly simple story in which flight is lost once in the ancestor of the, uh, of the flightless species. And then about 2008, uh, researchers uh, sequencing a handful of genes and then followed up with other data later showed that, uh, in fact, tinamus were nested deep within the flightless radiation. And this was very puzzling. I, was, I personally was very skeptical of this result when it was first proposed. But uh, multiple different data sets, and as well as our own, have now uh, corroborated this. And of course, what this means is that it's likely that floss w flight was lost not just once, but multiple times in multiple different lineages. Of course, there's a possibility that flight could have indeed been lost in the ancestor and then re-evolved in the tinamus. This is, uh, I think, a hypothesis worth considering, but it's likely implausible, if only because it's much, much more complicated to uh, originate flight, requiring lots of coordination of the musculature and the brain architecture, as well as physiology. Uh, than it is to lose flight. And, you know, there's a fairly big region of uh, parameter space. Here we're looking at the rate of gain of flight and the rate of loss of flight. There is a region up here where it's actually more likely for flight to be lost multiple times uh, rather than um, gained once, uh, rather than lost once in the ancestor and then gained again. So we'll sort of proceed uh, with in this uh, framework, although you know, I think it's certainly an, a good question to ask whether flight could have re-evolved in the tinamus. <clears throat> so we did a lot of genome sequencing, uh, and um, this is all in the sort of pre-long read days. So these are, I think, solid genomes, although they're certainly not chromosome assembly level. Uh, and we inherited a, a draft genome of a little bushmallow that was put together by uh, Alan Baker, who was one of our collaborators, but sadly uh, passed away in the early stages of our collaboration. Um, actually, I've been spending quite a bit of time uh, during my sabbatical in Gothenburg sort of annotating this genome and uh, learning what we can from it. And we've learned some really cool things, I would say, about its uh, sensory biology. So uh, we've learned, for example, it has a really full complement of olfactory receptor genes. Uh, and uh, it also appears to have been able to uh, have s been able to see in the UV spectrum, which is something we can learn from the uh, particular configuration of amino acids in the opsin genes. Um, anyway, our, our, our first order of business was to, um, you know, corroborate this phylogeny, and indeed we find the tinamus are nested within the flightless radiation. Um, we also resolved a, uh, a minor controversy involving the rheas, uh, which tended to bounce around the tree, especially in analyses in which the many genes that were uh, employed were sort of concatenated together into a big super gene. Uh, we find that using approaches in which uh, each gene is allowed to vary um, sort of stochastically around a, 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 a demographic history of the group, we found that those sorts of models gave us much more stable results, uh, sort of these coalescent models. Um, and, you know, uh, although these branches are, are quite short, uh, they, you know, they're very hard to break. We can look at different subsets of the data, different uh, configurations, different models of substitution, uh, and we really get a very strong and consistent result. And I should say that this, uh, this topology is also independently supported by uh, a myriad um, of uh, transposable element insertions, which we could mine uh, from our data. So we're actually quite confident uh, in this uh, particular topology, uh, which of course implies, you know, up to uh, potentially five losses of flight, uh, depending on what you want to assume about the, the biogeography. So I will say that we spent a lot of time looking at the pattern of evolution of proteins on this tree. And, you know, our basic question was, do we see evidence of convergent evolution of proteins? Do we see evidence of 
convergent acceleration or adaptive evolution of proteins on this tree associated with loss of flight. And although we do find uh, a handful on the order of 200 genes, which show some evidence of convergent evolution associated with loss of flight, uh, those genes don't together uh, comprise a coherent group. When we look at things like gene ontology terms, uh, we don't see uh, clear signals for you know, developmental biology or muscle architecture or, or whatever. Um, and so I won't tell you about that work and we'll move st straight to the, I would argue, much more challenging 98% uh, of the genome, which is non-coding, and which uh, you know, has been proposed to uh, kind of harbor this sort of vast regulatory network that we're still uh, learning to understand. Uh, and so, um, but remarkably, it is, you know, non-coding DNA is, of course, the vast majority of the DNA, uh, not only of, of birds, but of, 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 of most animals. And so, um, it behooves us to really start to dig into this, uh, this challenging uh, re region of the genome, which, you know, has been called the dark matter of the genome, I think, appropriately, because it's all over the place, and yet we can barely see it. And so, we honed in on a... Um, class of marker, which we call conserved non-exonic elements. These are basically uh, non-coding regions. They don't occur in any exons, but they're highly conserved between species. And so you can see here an example, uh, which is uh, this black region indicates high conservation uh, all the way from mammals uh, down to fish, essentially. Um, and these are um, really intriguing regions. Uh, some of you using ultra-conserved elements uh, for phylogenetic purposes. Well, ultra-conserved elements are a subset of these conserved non-exonic elements. As, I mean, if they, especially if they occur outside of a, a gene. And so we found uh, upwards of 280,000 of these that were moderately long enough such that we could actually measure their rates easily uh, on a phylogenetic tree. Now, these regions are important because they often are thought to act as enhancers. And enhancers, of course, are uh, a class of uh, the genome, subset of the genome, whose function is to recruit trans transcription factors and essentially initiate uh, gene expression. And so, um, and of course, we're learning a lot more about how these enhancers uh, come together with other parts of the genome, um, often at quite a big di uh, distance along the chromosome. And um, I think, uh, you know, they're a group of a subset of the genome that, that were, whose functions we're still learning about and which are, you know, arguably more challenging to study, I would say, than protein coding genes whose uh, language essentially we understand much better. And so we, uh, we teamed up with some statisticians to basically develop a model in which we could very sensitively detect increases in rate occurring on convergent lineages, okay? So uh, here we can call those convergent lineages, these target lineages, such as one, two, three, and four here in red. Most methods that you uh, would throw at a problem like this would tend to not be able to discriminate elements that are genuinely convergently accelerating in only these target lineages uh, from those that are accelerating both in these non-target lineages and in the target lineages. Um, and so using a, a series of um, Bayes factor tests, essentially what we do is we place each branch in a um, class, one of three classes, the background class, a conserved class, or a accelerated class. And those classes have a certain uh, probability of transitioning between them, which is indicated by this matrix here. And using a series of Bayes factor tests, we're essentially able to weed out those elements which are accelerated on a clade-wide basis, as opposed to being accelerated just convergently. So, um, and you know, we came up with some really interesting results, such as this element here, which is highly conserved across you know 120 million years of bird evolution, and yet is specifically accelerated in these uh, flightless, these two flightless lineages. Um, some other examples are here where we find um, either single uh, accelerations within the ratites or multiple convergent accelerations. Um, and so these are um, candidates, I would say, uh, 
for elements which are either changing their function in flightless birds or which are losing their function, of course, with potential uh, effects on gene regulation. Um, okay, good. Now, um, so what we did was we looked at genes in the vicinity of elements which were convergently uh, or otherwise accelerated in the flightless birds. And uh, we actually come up with, um, so these are all, in red, these are all genes which have a high density of these so-called ratite accelerated elements in their vicinity on the chromosome. And it's, it's very exciting because we actually identify some genes such as TBX5, which is, um, there's TBX, which have been known for a long time to be involved with phenotypes of relevance to uh, flightlessness. Um, uh, work done even in, in emus as a developmental model has implicated TBX5 in terms of uh, slow growth of the forelimb as well as uh, loss of, of the keel. Um, and then we also find other kinds of genes such as DOC1 and some homeobox genes which you know, have uh, clear developmental roles in skeletal evolution. So the uh, clarity of the functions of genes implicated by looking at these non-coding regions was much more clear than with the proteins themselves. And so this was our first indication that perhaps it's more regulatory evolution rather than changes in proteins themselves which are driving this phenotype. Now, knowing all this doesn't, still doesn't tell us what aspects of the flightless phenotype might be being driven by these genomic changes. And so for that, we turn to um, some epigenetic approaches such as ataxic. So briefly, ataxic is basically a, a method for uh, learning whether a particular region of the genome is in a sort of closed, inactive state in which it's tightly wound around the nucleosomes and basically inert versus an active state where the uh, genome is unwound and basically accessible to transcription factors that can come in. And I think that this is actually a very straightforward technique. It's not expensive. And I actually think it has a huge potential in ecology and evolution generally. Thinking about birds in, and other groups, of course, uh, in different sort of physiological states or different uh, uh, behavioral states, I think we can learn a lot about what their genome is doing because we can look at the chromatin state, not sort of, a, we don't have to look at the whole organism, we can look at how it changes in different organs uh, across uh, different physiological states, or in our case, different developmental states. And so, for example, we could show that these uh, CNEEs were overrepresented in regions of open chromatin in a variety of structures of relevance to loss of flight. So here, for example, is looking at open chromatin in the forelimb or the hind limb or the keel, and we can show that these conserved elements are occurring in those regions of open chromatin at those particular developmental stages more frequently than expected. And this, of course, um, increases the likelihood that these are acting as genuine enhancers uh, changing gene regulation. And so it's, this is what allowed us essentially to ask whether an element might be implicated, for example, more in the forelimb evolution rather than the keel or some other aspect of the phenotype. And in fact, when we look at, um, when we tr sort of try to assay the ability of a given enhancer to drive gene expression in this case in the developing forelimb, here we're uh, basically uh, developing a construct and uh, injecting the chicken version of a particular enhancer into the chicken forelimb, uh, the tinamou version, as well as the uh, rhea version. Um, we can show that only the chicken and tinamou versions are able to drive gene expression as indicated by this, uh, these, this green fluorescence. The rhea version, which we already knew was highly accelerated and changed in sequence, does not appear to be capable of driving gene expression uh, in this uh, chick system. And so um, this was, you know, an indication that changes in sequence of these non-coding elements did in fact result in changes or loss of function. And so um, sort of trying to come full circle on this. And although I, I won't uh, 
talk much more about it. Basically, now we're sort of trying to conduct a more comprehensive survey of chromatin states and gene expression across this subset of the uh, Palignathus birds um, to look at questions of uh, convergence at the whole genome level and uh, at the whole transcriptome level. Um, and so I'll just um, fast forward to my, uh, well, just to, I've, hopefully I've told you some interesting examples about um, the role of genic change in bird evolution as well as the role of, of regulatory change. And I think for, you know, the vast majority of biodiversity that we can't cross in the lab, uh, this phylo G2P approach, I think it's going to be very important for linking genotype and phenotype. So I'd just like to thank uh, my collaborators, particularly on the Ratite project, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Scott, for a fantastically sort of wide-ranging and stimulating um, lecture. Uh, there's a mic at the back if um, people have questions. So if you raise your hands, if you have any questions for Scott, um, you can think one back there. So, yeah. Yeah. Is that on? Yep. You can just hear me behind a mask. I'm Intrigued by the difference in what you found compared to a study published on the Galapagos flightless cormorant. And of course, in that study, which was published, they looked for protein coding changes and found them, whereas, whereas you looked for regulatory changes and found them. Are you finding different things, or are you, just look, are you looking from different angles at the same problem, do you think? I, I'm having trouble hearing. Um. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll move That's out. okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll move out here. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the, in, a, in a published study on the Galapagos flightless cormorant. Yes. They, oh yes, yes, yes. They, they found protein yes. coding changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Well. So, so you so you you stress regulatory change. Fair enough. Fair enough. They. Do you want to make the contrast between the two. No, it's not a contrast because they they actually didn't even look at outside the protein coding regions of of that of those birds. Cool cool study, but you know. Uh, they didn't look at the other 98% of the genome. And so I would say that, um, you know, uh, I, yeah, I think um, conceivably there could be both protein and regulatory contributions to these phenotypes. Um, and, you know, I think that raises the question of a couple things. You know, how do we score our phenotypes? For example, is loss of flight, is it sort of a binary trait or is it more of a continuous trait? Um, and that, I think, uh, will be important in terms of, uh, you know, what, what kinds of uh, loci rise to the top when we, when we look across the genome. So, yeah, in interesting study. Um, we'd like to say we, we did a more thorough job at the, looking at the... <laughs> okay, you can pass the mic down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in these um, enhancer elements. So. They're having their effect through their sequence, as I understand it, because you detected them from their accelerated rate of sequence evolution. Do you have any ideas how that sequence is important and affecting the shape of their accessibility um, during chromosome Right, folding? yeah. I mean, one thing we haven't done a lot of is um, looking at, for example, how have transcription factor binding sites changed when uh, element becomes accelerated. And yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting work that could be done. You know, a lot of transcription factors have very, you know, set signatures in the sequence that they bind to. And yeah, my, our, our hunch is that a lot of these binding sites are changing or, or perhaps being eroded, but we actually haven't done a systematic look at that yet. So I, I think that's definitely uh, would be of interest to look at, yeah. Uh, Tim Joe, I think next to. Yes, thanks for a great talk. There's some fascinating uh, case studies there. The one I wanted to ask about was the, uh, the one about the Andean hemispingi, which I take to be the uh, uh, plural of hemispingus. Um, yeah, obviously it's a great example of a, the leapfrog pattern, where yes. you've got a different color variant uh, embedded in the ancestral population. Unlike others though, like uh, um, polar bear nested in brown bear populations, where it's very clear 
that there is a, um, you know, a habitat difference, you know, snow adaptation to make it a, co a completely different colour. Right. In the Andes, I've been to those places, and it's exactly the same to my eyes. So I was just yeah. wondering, you said yeah. that you had some evidence that there was to do with adaptation. To me, it seems that some of these things are just, you know, chance, chance mutations. And so yeah. what is yeah, the link I mean, with adaptation that you found? Right. No, that's a really great question. And, you know, the, uh, these birds live in a fairly narrow band of elevation. And, yeah, the, if you do, you know, GIS... Uh, quantification of the habitat or whatever, uh, it's, it's, it's very uniform, it, you know, north to south. And so um, it's, it's, it's unlikely to our minds that it's some sort of adaptive evolution regarding the, the habitat. You know, the fallback for us is some sort of sexual selection. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence for that. I, I could imagine, you know, using mounts or something to see how birds are, or perhaps, you know, playback of calls or something. But um, it's the actual source of selection has been tough to get at in this case. And I don't think, um, I, you know, genomics may not be all that helpful there. It's, we're pretty, uh, we're excited to see if it's an example of regulatory change because that peak did not, doesn't land in a coding region, it's just sort of upstream. But what is driving it ultimately is, is a tough one, I would say, yeah. I think it's interesting that some of those uh, um, color changes, they link to the preferences in females or used in uh, territorial displays or something. So there's some linkage which keeps them stable despite the gene flow that you found. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, I think, you know, um, you could imagine maybe looking at the opsins will tell us about the, the visual preferences of females, who knows what. But, but yeah, I, that's, um, it's a really tough, tough question. And um, I think we're better at getting at the the history of the and origin of the adaptation rather than its 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 cause, right? Yeah. Okay. Time for um, one more question, I think probably as well. If anyone has a, another question. I'll just leave. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, there's a question there at the middle back. So Hi, that was great, thank you. Um, more kind of broad broader question. We're kind of, particularly your work in the flightlessness was really quite detailed, wet lab work and really digging in to find the detail. But we're in a kind of era of hundreds and thousands of genomes um, being available and you saw that in, in the BIRDS 10K project as well. How useful do you think that is going forward versus these kind of more detailed analyses where you, you have to do things like attack seek? How, how, useful? how useful are a thousand genomes? for looking at particular traits like flightness, flightlessness or any other particular traits like that versus how much do you need things like a taxi and more detailed experimental work? Right, I mean, I think, um, you know, in our case, the ataxi was really essential to move forward because, for example, the first summer uh, that Phil Grayson was doing this work, we, we, we had a list of accelerated elements, and from that we sort of said, well, let's try these and see if they show differential activity in this enhancer assay. And we basically came up with nothing. When we had the attack data, you know, we could see, okay, this element is open in the developing forelimb, so we know it's active. Let's choose from that subset. And then our success rate became much, much higher. So, you know, I think, I think these projects like the the Darwin project, which is very, very exciting. I think those are gonna provide like a foundation for these sorts of downstream studies. And um, yeah, it's, I, I, you know, like I say, attack, it may seem super complicated, but attack seek is super, it's really easy. And I think it has a lot of potential in studies of natural populations that hasn't really been exploited yet, so, yeah. Okay, one last quick question. Um, yeah, you can pass the mic. Thank you. Um, also, I'd like to ask about the ratite evolution. Um, it's one of the best examples I know of, of where parsimony or your expectation of parsimony is so gloriously broken <laughs> that this principle which under, has underlined a lot of science going back to the Keplerian revolution, um, we, we question it. And so I wanted to know if there are other examples, I'm not particularly familiar with the field, of parsimony, parsimony being so excellently broken when you do depth phylogenetic analyses of, uh, of traits, so if, if you can comment on the, in the field of birds. 
um, might be interested. Yeah, well, um, no, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion in sort of uh, history of systematics. I mean, I think I might question that your assertion that parsimony is important across a lot of sciences. I mean, I think we have a lot of examples where parsimony can, you know, uh, often works as a heuristic, but um, it, it, you know, when you push it, it might actually fail where other methods are more general. And so, um, but no, I appreciate your, uh, the point that um, under what circumstances do we just sort of uh, reject the, the parsimonious scenario. And um, yeah, um, you know, in this case, I think, I think one thing we could do is, is look for patterns in the genome that perhaps might suggest a, a second origin of flight. Look, maybe accelerated elements in the Tinamu, for example. And I think that, that's, that's definitely something that, that we should do. And, um, and yeah, I, I think ultimately, um, you know, signatures in the genome will perhaps be an additional clue as to what the actual scenario was. Yeah. Okay, it's, um, we're just past five, so I think um, we should probably call a halt to uh, questions in this session. Um, just say that actually we're going to go for drinks in the King's Arms um, in a short while. So any of you that have additional questions that you'd like to put to Scott, um, come along there and I'm sure you can trap them in a corner there and, and, and ask your question. Um, so I think just uh, in closing, I'd like to say thanks very much, Scott, for a really fascinating, stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.